I'm Pete Thompson. I'm the uh, principal support engineer at, uh, for TotalView at Rogue Wave. Um, as such, I get to hear a lot of problems. Um, it's, uh, even, even the debuggers have bugs in them, so we uh, get to hear that a lot from our uh, companies. TotalView is just one of many products owned by Rogue Wave. Uh, we were acquired by a, our larger company, Rogue Wave, about six years ago. Uh, some of the other things that we have uh, that are available, Clockwork, which is on-the-fly static code analysis, so you can actually uh, debug things a little bit before you actually run them. Code Dynamics is a new version of TotalView. It's the uh, new interface, uh, user interface that we've been talking about for many, many years. Uh, open Logic support. Uh, uh, basically, what I know is TotalView. So these are some of the other things that are there. We just recently acquired Zend, which uh, is used for PHP. Um, they're the developers of PHP, which is used over 60% of the web, uh, something like that. And we have various libraries, Source Pro, Visualization, uh, Views, PV Wave, which is used to um, visualize data, IMSL libraries, et cetera. But what I know most about is TotalView. So how does Rogue Wave help you in HPC? So TotalView for HPC is your basic source code debugger. Um, David has already given us a good, good introduction on what debuggers do and what you can do with them. So I don't need to go over some of the basic stuff. But uh, source code, visibility into applications, um, control over your applications. Scalability, we have also been uh, working on our scalability for years. We also have users who run over 100,000 cores. Uh, usability and support for all HPC platforms and languages. Um, so let me give you an overview on TotalView itself. That's just the introduction slide. So um, TotalView has been around for a really long time, actually. It started up, um, it started up basically because of this thing. The first massively par parallel computer back in the 1980s built by Bolt, Bernack, and Newman called the Butterfly Machine. You can see it got its name somewhat from this uh, diagram. They had um, roughly 32 CPUs there, you know, 16 on each side. I don't think they actually made a machine that was quite that big, but uh, then, but when you have that, when you have a machine that does that and is parallel, you have to divide the code to uh, run on this. And of course, as everybody knows, code is hard to do, and it contains bugs. So how do you debug a butterfly? The TotalView project was developed as a solution for this type of environment. Some of the uh, core requirements they wanted to do were the ability to debug multiple processes and threads at the same time. There's a desire for a point and click interface, because at that time, most of the debuggers were all command line debuggers. Uh, we still have command line support, but oddly enough, we added the command line support after we did the GUI support. Uh, then we have multiple and mixed language support. So you can have C, C++, Fortran, uh, things we've added recently, a Clang. Um, it all depends a lot on what the compiler writers are using for the debug interface. Um, our core development group has been there from the beginning. The, the main project lead for TotalView was back at uh, BBN in the 1980s, and some of them have, uh, a lot of the people came with that group. Um, after uh, the butterfly machine eventually didn't become a very big seller, so the core group for uh, that was working on TotalView split off from BBN. Uh, they were brought up by another company for a while, and then we became independent until finally Rogue Wave brought us up about six years ago. Uh, as such, the, uh, a lot of the development team has been involved in debugging from the beginning. Um, we've helped define some of the MPI interfaces. Um, as you debug uh, a program with TotalView or DDT, you'll notice that 
You don't have to go and attach to each process by yourself. There is an underlying interface that tells us how to, how to do this for us. And that was developed by a group of people, uh, some from Argonne um, and some from TotalView. That was not, not meant to be a de facto standard, but it kind of became one when other people uh, reverse engineered it and started using it. Um, a number of years later, we um, helped develop a NPR uh, interface for getting information out of message queues. So if you're, you're, all your MPI is passing things back and forth between the queues, um, if there's something wrong and those messages are not actually consumed, if you have an MPI send, it's consumed by a send, uh, MPI receive, that's fine, it'll just disappear, but things get stuck, they get deadlocked. And um, we have ways of actually pulling out that information and showing it to you. Uh, and lately, we've been working on the OpenMP debugging interface, OMPD. Uh, we have a group, uh, a small group, two people basically, who have been working on that and defining it. Uh, we have, uh, we're waiting for some of the uh, compiler writers to uh, come along with this. So it's still an ongoing forum that's being uh, developed. But we do have some, some results from that, and it's starting to come into the uh, interface right now. Other capabilities have been added along um, over time. So we support most types of MPI. Uh, usually those are the ones who have incorporated that uh, informal interface. Uh, Linux uh, is an interesting story that uh, at one point our president of TotalView um, didn't see any, any um, benefit in supporting Linux. Of course, now Linux is probably 90% of what we do. Uh, lightweight memory debugging. Um, there are tools like Vampir and uh, Something that begins with a P and it just escapes me at the moment, um, which are used for um, doing heavyweight uh, memory debugging. They'll actually instrument your program and run through things. You can find out all, lots, all sorts of interesting things, but they're usually somewhat slow. So we have developed a lightweight memory debugging, which usually sits between your program and the system libraries, just capturing things going back and forth low overhead, and you can find a lot of inform interesting information from that. Type transformations, uh, everybody, lots of people here are using STL libraries and Boost and things like that. Uh, and these, if you take a look and dive on the types, you'll find out that they're very, very complicated. There's lots of pointers that actually, where your actual data resides is sometimes mysterious. Uh, we can use type transformations just to show you the data that's actually in the containers. MemScript and TVScript are uh, two tools for doing debugging on the, uh, without any intervention. You basically uh, set up events or action points for TVScript. Uh, you can run the tools overnight, um, get results in the morning. Uh, we have at least one user who's incorporates it into his um, bat and daily, daily build cycle. So they'll, they'll run their program on, through MemScript and take a look at the things in the results in the morning to find out whether or not uh, they've introduced any new leaks into the program. Reverse de debugging, which is only available on Linux x86, um, is a really nice tool. It allows you to um, record your program as it's, being, as it's being debugged. And you can get, go past a point where the program crashes, and then you can decide to go back and forth over what you've actually done beforehand. So uh, we've gotten to places where the program just crashes entirely, and you take a look to see what the stack looked like, and there's no stack left. Usually what's happened there is somebody's overwritten the stack memory, uh, but you can go back and back with re reverse debugging, replay engine we call it, and see, you can go back a couple of steps and all of a sudden the stack pops up again. 
so you can see where things have happened. Go back and forth in recorded history. A uh, remote display client, which is uh, somewhat like the tool that uh, David was describing, where you can run it on your, your laptop, uh, your Windows, um, Linux, Mac, laptop, and use it to log into a system like, um, like Mirror or Cooley. Um, I've actually been doing that today to capture some of the slides we'll see later. GPU debugging. Um, CUDA debugging, uh, we support most of the uh, various flavors of CUDA that are out today, 6, 6, 7, uh, 6, 5. Uh, 8, 0 is in development right now, but uh, we've been testing it and things seem to work as expected. Intel Xeon Phi debugging, uh, which will include the uh, Knight's Landing. Um, that's just really seen as uh, looking at a another node, and currently we're looking at the uh, ARM64 port. Uh, it's coming along fairly nicely from what I understand, uh, and we hope to have that available sometime soon. So what are the key features of TotalView? We have interactive debugging, just standing there doing your debugging sessions um, at the terminal. Interactive memory debugging, so the memory debugging is you run while you're running the debugger, or you can run memory escape standalone. Reverse debugging, we were talking about just a little bit before, and unattended debugging, which is the um, TV script and M script. And this all works on serial, parallel, and accelerated applications. So this gives a, uh, a view of our memory debugging tool. So how do you identify memory debugging flows? So uh, <clears throat> you run this. You run under memory escape. You don't really have to do any special um, compilation or linking for doing memory debugging. You can use the various tools here for um, taking a look. This is, gives a graphical view of the heap status, heap status graphical view. The only memory we debug is heap memory. Um, people have asked about stack memory, but uh, we only have the heap memory available because that's where we we're able to use the heap interposition agent to slip between the, the program and the system libraries. What happens is that whenever you do a free or malloc, total view will, or memory escape will capture that, that call, record some information about it. We may manipulate the call a little bit depending on what you're trying to do. Um, and then we'll pass it off to to the system library, get the results back, we'll store those results. And it's usually very, very low overhead. There is some overhead, of course, but it's not too bad. So we can detect malloc API issues, things like double freeze, and uh, get a return from malloc that's not quite correct, it's not aligned or something. Buffer overflows, um, that's one of the features where you can tell it that you want to look for corrupted memory usually, um, and we'll detect that. Um, it's easy to use. It works, works with uh, all the vendor libraries. No recompilation, no instrumentation needed. And uh, we'll get a little bit more into that later. Reverse debugging. So how do you, how do you solve an intermittent failure? Without, without total view, you can set a breakpoint in and, and your code and then you realize you ran past the problem, so you reload it, you set the breakpoint earlier, hope it fails, keep repeating until you narrow down on the, on the problem. With total view, you can start rebugging, start recording, you set your breakpoint, and then you see the failure. And at that point, you, maybe, you're, maybe you're already past where things have happened, or maybe, maybe you've gotten a seg fault, and you want to see what, what actually caused that. Sometimes crashing the program will lead to a state where you don't know what's going on anymore. So you run backwards and forwards in the, in the context of the failing execution. I do this all m myself all the time when I'm looking at things in total view itself. So, so. so it recreates the context when going backwards. It focuses down to a specific problem area. And usually it saves days in re recreating it. Replay Engine does have a bit, bit more of an overhead. And it does cause things to run a little bit slower. But if you can create the problem with this, 
you can save days in trying to fix what's going on. MemScript and TVScript. So there's a command line invocation. Um, usually, you can set this up in a batch job or just run it yourself and see what it does. TVScript is, sets breakpoints, and then you can take actions at those breakpoints. So we, we create an action point in method one, and there's various ways of setting it. And then you define different actions that you want to take it there. So this will display the back place, backtrace. It'll show arguments. And then we can create another one. It gives a uh, little different method for setting it. We want to set it up in line 342. You can print a variable and um, do the A data set. Oh, then my prog is actually the, the program that you're trying to do, and this would be arguments to the program. And memory script is very similar, but it's usually focused just on memory debugging. You can't uh, use that to set a breakpoint. So uh, it'll display data whenever a memory action takes place. Exit is always an event. So here we have things where, um, so an event action, we'll do list allocations in any event. We'll check guard blocks. Uh, we turn guard blocks on. Guard blocks are uh, where memory escape takes a little bit more control of your program when you're doing a malloc. We'll take your request. We'll add a little bit more to that request. So we have a pre-guard pre block and a post-guard block. We'll put different patterns into those. Um, and then when the, when the memory gets freed, what will happen is that we take a look at the, the guard blocks at that time. And if they've changed, we know somebody's written it to them when they shouldn't have gone past those boundaries. Uh, we have no show. Display specifiers is just various ways of filtering the data. And again, it's you give it my program and the program arguments. And one of the nice things about this is that you can save the <coughs> MemScript data in HTML, memory debug file, text heap data file. The memory debug file can be used to rerun the program again, load that memory debug file, and you can take a look interactively at the memory data that's being displayed. Remote display client is something that we recommend for people who are um, sitting remotely, of course. If you're trying to just log into a machine, um, we're based in Massachusetts. I'm up in New Hampshire myself. Uh, I log into computers across, across the country. and if you're just logging in and trying to push those bits back and forth, because this is a, I mean, Total View is basically an X11 display, uh, the, the amount of data that needs to go back and forth to change that display is very large. With the remote display client, we have the uh, client sitting on your, your Windows or your Linux or your Mac, um, and then we uh, have the uh, remote system is running a, a remote display server that launches Total View within there, and then we use smart compression to get everything back and forth. And it's it's basically based on VNC, so we're using uh, uh, if you use VNC all the time, it's another way of getting the type of thing. But uh, we package it all up for you, so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, here's a RDC setup that I use for to get into Vesta. Um, so I have Vesta up here. You give it your username. If you have to get go through a, a series of hosts in order to do it, um, you may have a gateway machine or something. You can set that up in the same access value. Usually, um, you give it the path to Total View on the most host. If it's already in your path when you're logged in, you just have to put in Total View. Um, here at uh, <coughs> Argon, we use run job as the actual job that's being um, run. And the, the target program is all C over here. But we need all these. I mean, but we're actually starting total view on the run job. So. Um, and you can, you can specify a, a batch system that you're using. Uh, the submit command would be Q sub here. And, there is a little, little shell script that you need to modify a little bit to uh, tell it how to run on the system, and any, any other commands. I, you can see I did this up last year. I have uh, the Q 
Q is ATP PESC 2015, uh, running 512 and pushing it out to, our, to the log file. For CUDA debugging, we have a slightly different interface. Uh, we support, uh, as I mentioned, we are, we're now supporting 8.0. We have support for dynamic parallelism. You can do MPI-based uh, clusters with multi-card configurations, which is uh, some of the things that are coming into play now. We're having a lot of, a lot of people who have GPUs on, on their clusters, all the nodes of the clusters. Um, flexible display and navigation. Up here, you can see that I have the physical block over here, so we're seeing things as, I can't quite see that, devices, the MPI, the warps and the lanes, the SMP rather, the warps and the lanes. Uh, there's little boxes, little arrows under there where you can write into them basically to, tell, to go back and forth. Um, you can change that if you prefer to a logical grid and block type tuple. Um, and we have a CUDA device window, which I did not show here. I usually try and bring up the CUDA device window when I'm doing uh, CUDA display debugging. Uh, that gives me an idea of which devices and which warps and lanes are actually there at the time debugging that particular program. We've added support for CUDA core debugging so that if the CUDA core, the CUDA program, or the kernel itself crashes. We can load in the core file and take a look at that. Uh, we use CUDA memcheck. We can, if there's any problem with uh, CUDA memory, we'll show it for that. And we have support for OpenACC. This is mostly on the Cray at the moment. Um, but uh, you can just write your code in OpenACC and uh, it'll pull up the kernel, CUDA kernels at that time. We're also um, adding support for a couple of things called uh, portable parallel layers. Uh, I know people here, uh, people from uh, Livermore might know about that, something called Raja. I think it's Sandia, they have uh, Cocos. This is um, debugging kernel, or writing kernel code is rather hard to do. Um, and Raja, what that does, it'll take your, your, the, the regions that you want to parallel, parallelize, uh, much as you would do in something like an OpenMP parallelization directive. Uh, and it'll, it'll run that, it'll decode that into the type of um, parallelization you want to do. It can be used for OpenMP, uh, you can use it for GPUs and CUDA, and uh, that looks like it's going to be an important thing, uh, framework coming forward. Uh, and here we have total view for the Intel Xeon Phi, and Knight's Landing is one of these. Um, we, we've heard about Aurora, and that's coming, coming soon. We should be able to run on that without any problems. So it, it supports all the major Intel Xeon Phi coprocessor configurations. The, uh, Knight's Landing is not so much a coprocessor, it's almost more of a, a regular processor. Um, so we have native mode, which you can run with or without MPI directly on the Xeon Phi. Uh, you can offload directives where you're using, um, much like OpenMP directives, you're offloading the uh, particular region onto the, onto the processor. Um, so that's Similar, similar to what's going to on with GPU, you can use the symmetric mode where you're using both the host and the coprocessor uh, as multi-device and multi-node. Um, when KNL, KNL support is kind of just coming on, um, but it works just, just like normal. Uh, we're, we're finally getting some KNL machines to play around with. Uh, it's been tested. It looks, looks fine. Nothing really needed to be done, but uh, we do need to add the AVX2 support to show the new registers and instructions. User interface, um, regular MPI debugging features, uh, process control, you can view across, um, across all the processes. Breakpoints can be shared on 
any particular MPI uh, or across the, the shared code. And you can also set it up so that you set the breakpoints in just one particular process or just one particular thread. So it's heterogeneous, bugs the, both, both Xeon and Intel Xeon 5 processes. And memory debugging is also um, available in both the native and symmetric code. So Knight's, Knight's Landing memory is uh, going to be interesting. They have this onboard high, high bandwidth memory, which can be accessed faster with the cache uh, explicitly managed. You can, you can set up the, um, at boot time, I believe you can set up how you're going to manage that memory. Uh, some of it can be cache and, and some of it not. Uh, memory escape will be able to track allocations in both the standard heap and the on, on chip HPM. Optimizations may include making sure that the right data structures are available. Now, I could say this, is, this may be a little bit of uh, wishful thinking because we really haven't had the KNLs to play around with just yet. Um, but we, we've, started, we've started receiving it. We have one machine. We've been working with Cray to uh, make sure things work on, on their, their versions, the same type of things that Aurora will turn out to be. Um, we, we aren't always allowed access onto that machine, though. So. Uh, we also have uh, support for Linux Open Power, which is the little Endian machines. Um, all major functionality, and uh, one of the major projects we're working on is to support CUDA debugging on, on the GPU accelerators on these. Right now, uh, most of the CUDA debugging that we do is uh, just limited to Linux x86, but on Linux Power, um, the, port, the port to the little Endian machines was actually very simple. Um, because a lot of the other machines that we work with these days, the Intel machines and such, are already a little Indian. Total view is memory efficiency. So, total view is uh, the way total view works when we're doing MPI is that we will start up debug servers on the back end nodes, on the compute nodes. We have the main total views running, and then there's just a, a lightweight server running there. Servers don't steal memory from the ap application. Um, you really, when you want your, when you're running something on the compute node, you really just want it to run as fast as possible and not have any other processes interfering with it. Each server is a multi-process debugging agent. Uh, one server can control, can debug thousands of processes. It's not like um, there's one server per process running on each compute node. So we have a uh, <coughs> a process per server content. And there, there's no artificial limits to accommodate the debuggers. It's not as if we need one process per compute node. Symbols are all read, stored, and shared in the front end client. And here's an example that we ran at uh, Lawrence Livermore. There are 920 shared libraries, uh, 64 processors, four compute nodes, 16 processors per compute node, and one server per compute node. If I'm reading that right, but basically the uh, <coughs> TV client itself, uh, the, the virtual size is uh, about 450, 4,500. Uh, the resident side is just under 4,000. The uh, MRNet uh, COM node process, uh, 497 on, on virtual size, but only four on the uh, real size, resident size. And the, the TV server itself, while taking up uh, 304 megabytes, um, is only resident size of 53 megabytes. So it's all fairly lightweight. We wouldn't want to have the TV client running on all the back end nodes. People have told us for some time that the TotalView GUI is somewhat old fashioned looking. We've realized that. Um, so we've come up with a new framework which uh, looks very similar to other things we've seen before. Um, the kind of an Eclipse type framework. We have the code here in the middle, um, the display of the processes that are under control over here. This is a variable window. This, I believe, gives us our um, process stacks, or maybe these are the variables in there. A little, little bit fuzzy on the display here. Um, 
And this is also very configurable. You can just tear these things off, put them where you want them. I know I've been playing around with it recently, and I think I've gotten into some configuration, which is not the default configuration like this. The only caution I would have at the moment is this is not quite ready for HPC. We're, we're, we've been working on it uh, a bit, but it's um, not at the point I'd like to see it. It's starting to get there. So when you're using TotalView, uh, there, there are two ways, when you're doing an MPI debugging, there are two ways to start the debugger. The classic method is to start TotalView on the MPI starter process. So you have TotalView, args MPI exec, you give it everything after the MPI exec is basically what you would do to start your MPI program normally. Um, <clears throat> then you can just add TotalView-args. Usually what I do is I, I get my, my uh, command line ready to execute the program, and after I'm satisfied that I have it set up the way I want it to, I'll do TotalView, I'll just add TotalView-args up. So this will start up the uh, total view on the parallel starter, which MPI exec, srun, run job, et cetera. And when you hit go, the job will start up. The process will be automatically attached. That's part of the automatic um, att attach interface I talked about before. At this point, you'll see your source and you can set breakpoints. So some points to consider are that, that you don't see your source at first since we're really debugging the MPI starter process. Um, some MPIs don't support the process acquisition method. Most, most do, but we've run into problems where uh, sometimes the version that you get, the, the source RPM versions that you might get of um, an MPI distribution, usually when they we go to build the RPM, it strips out a lot of the information that we need to build uh, to actually find out what processes and what nodes to attach to. But in general, it's more scalable than the next method. This is known as the indirect method, and there are several flavors of indirect, which still confuses a lot of the other support people that I talk to. I've, I've pretty much got it down straight, but um, it gets a little, little confusing. So you can simply start TotalView or TotalView My MPI, and it comes up with what do you want to do now, uh, it's a session manager window, and you say you want to debug a parallel program. So you come along and you pick your parallel program. You pick your parallel system. Um, this is one of a large list. Um, uh, Blue Gene Q Cobalt is the one that would be specific here. Uh, you'd give it the number of tests here. And additional starter arguments. This is something that I ran into a problem when I was playing around to, with today because I gave it the starter arguments for my program and I realized, no, that, that wasn't what I really wanted to do. I, that's, these are the arguments for MPI itself. So there is another screen after this which you actually pick the um, program that you're trying to debug and any arguments that go to that program. So We do, however, have um, the new UI for HPC. It's not, it's not quite where I want it to be yet, but um, it, is, it does work. So when you use this, um, the way you would start it up is basically give it the Classic invocation that we did before. Uh, so you have total view, new UI, <coughs> give it args MPI exec and your number, number of processes, the process you want to run. And it comes up with a screen that looks a little bit different from the, the code dynamics screen I showed you before. This is uh, because I think I've been playing around with it a little bit and just moved things around and it got stuck there. Um, so sources over here, we have uh, various tabs which shows which program you're actually looking at at the moment. This gives a uh, display of the processes um, that are being controlled. You can configure this display to look a little differently. Uh, you can aggregate the display. Not sure if I'm showing that here. This is our call stack for the process that we're currently focused on. There's a data pane. There's a variable window, which is hidden under here. Again, I did something strange to it. Uh, here is our command line interface. You can type command lines directly into here. And this is, oh, 
This is for looking up uh, variables or functions here. Here's one of the uh, <coughs> starting memory escape and replay engine. Um, memory escape has to be started up at the beginning of your process. Um, that's because that since we're interposing a um, agent in between the, the system and the, your program into the system libraries, you can't do that after your program's already started up. That'd be breaking all the links and such. Um, replay engine, however, can be enabled at the start or any point during debugging. Once it's started, you can't disable it. So we have a uh, button here to enable the replay engine, another one to enable memory debugging. On the uh, Total View window, there's also a record button, which if uh, you're at a breakpoint or you decide you're, you're pretty close to the area where you want to see what's going on, you just click on the record button, and that process will be running on your memory uh, replay engine at that point. Here's a uh, little shot of things I did when I was running on Vesta earlier. <coughs> the uh, screen here, I can give you a little idea of what's going on. We're, so we're stopped at a breakpoint. And what I wanted to do here is show you um, the message queue information. So I, there's a uh, tools over here where I can bring down, drop down uh, menu, picked on message queues. And this is what came up. The, I've clicked on the options, which is up here, and turned on the ability to see the pending receives and the uh, pending sends and pending receives and the unexpected messages. So this is a program called All to All. So we're doing a MPI broadcast. Um, <clears throat> all the processes are broadcasting to all the other processes. So this is a very busy looking display. If we had something that was a little bit simpler or less nodes, you'd be able to see that there are lines going you know, back and forth between nodes. Um, we can do various things with this. We can do cycle detection. Uh, you can see who's talking to who, if they're traveling in a loop or such. Um, this is, it can be a nice way to see what's going wrong with the process. This one's almost a little bit too busy to see things. But, um, one of the other things that you might be able to see better in the slides is um, this is a new root window that we have, there, our old root window. And our old display down here used to have a process grid where we just show everything, every single process that was attached at the time. Uh, the problem was that itself wasn't very scalable because if you're debugging 10,000, 100,000 processes and you try and fill in 10,000 boxes into that, it just takes a very long time. And uh, the same with the, uh, the root window, we would show every single process in the root window up here. So now we've got things uh, a little better fa fashioned. And there's a little button over here called configure. You can set what you want to see. Um, and we show an aggregation of the type of things up here. There'll be the, uh, it's hard to see here, but it has the number of processes, the range of processes that are at this particular state. So this may be process uh, 1 to 10. Uh, maybe this is 11 to 16. And then there's a dot display that shows the, uh, the threads that are attached at the same time. So a nice compact way of seeing the information that we used to display in a very long list of things. Memory debugging on the, on the uh, blue gene. Uh, I did say you didn't have to recompile or do many re-instrument re things. But on the blue gene, it's a little bit easier if you do what we call linking against the agent. So um, here, uh, what I did is I set up an environment variable just to make it a little bit easier to understand. So I set up uh, TV Live to point to the um, directory where the library exists. When you're compiling it, use the, uh, your favorite compiler, dash G, dash O. Give it the name of the program, and uh, dash L. Give it the library, the TV library. And this is actually a continuation on one line, but uh, it didn't quite fit on my slides, so it got continued on to the next one. Dash WL, comma, 
at dollar TV lod TV heap BGQ BGQS dot LD. This is for doing static um, debugging. Um, once you do that, you are um, good to go. This this will when you when you link against the agent, the information, the, the program is always running under memory debugging, even if you are not using total view or memory escape to view it. So this is something that you might want to do a separate copy of things for. Um, when you do um, get into memory escape, you can do various things, uh, set memory debugging options. Uh, you may enable, this is for doing it when you, before uh, you start the program. Uh, here, this is a, a case where I was running the program and I just wanted to change the memory debugging options a little bit. So memory debug, enable memory debugging is already on. The levels of debugging we have are low. Basically just picks up various events and, uh, when you're trying to do malloc and freeze. Uh, gives you the best performance. Medium adds corrupted memory detection by applying guard blocks. So guard blocks are the things where you add a little bit more memory on each year end of the program. Um, now that's, that's very nice and some people think that what will happen is that when your program overwrites those guard blocks it will automatically stop. We, but the overhead on that would be horrible. So what we do is that you can stop the program at any time and check for guard blocks or you can, um, when, the pro when the block is actually freed, we will do a guard block check for you and at that point we may detect that the guard block's been corrupted. High provides memory overruns and alerts by monitoring red zone violations. So the way red zones work is to line up your allocation at the edge of a page and then we go and protect the next page. So anytime you go past the end of that, that block, you're into the next page and it automatically gets notified. That's one way of actually picking up uh, read, read access as well as write access. Because guard blocks would only detect write access. And extreme enables all options. Um, sometimes I find extreme a little bit too high. Because um, you have guard blocks and red zones going at the same time and sometimes things can get into guard blocks but not into the red zones. You're wondering why things don't stop. Uh, there are other types of memory debugging we do. Um, you can uh, not cache your memory, but uh, hold on to your memory a little bit longer than when it gets freed. Instead of immediately releasing it back into the pool, we'll hold on to it for a little bit. And that may show different patterns going on in your, your programming, because if you're immediately you're using memory that has been just freed, it may still have um, data in there, which could affect things. Um, you can paint memory. You can use that to find uninitialized variables. Um, a lot of nice things you can do with it. Here's one of many reports available in memory debugging. Um, this one is a status, heap status bag trace report. So this shows you um, all the bytes that have been allocated, the count, how many times it's been allocated, the function it was allocated in, the line number that we get down to, and the actual um, source information. So these are the various things. This program was, um, I, I used the, the all C program doing the broadcast. Um, the program itself doesn't really do a lot of memory debugging or memory allocation, but you find that there's open MPI or the, uh, the MPI calls themselves are doing memory allocation. Interestingly enough, I found you know, leaks inside the memory there. Uh, and I, I suppose I should probably explain to you what that leaks in total view and memory scape are a little bit different than what you might think of as your, your basic program leaks. Um, since we have all the information about all the memory that's been allocated beforehand, once you decide to do a memory leak detection, what it'll do is that we take a look at the block that's been allocated. We had the, the, the start and end address of those. 
And then we'll look through your program for all the variables that might be considered pointer variables that would contain that information. And if we can't find anything that corresponds to that particular block and all the variables are in your program, then there's no way that you could possibly access that data. So that, that's what we consider a leak. So it's not just that you're constantly allocating memory and not freeing it. I mean, once, once you end the program, the, pr the memory is freed. And that's kind of a leak too, but we're getting to places where the um, memory is just not available or not able to be freed anymore by your program since you've lost the variable. So that's about it. We have, um, uh, I sent out uh, a email this morning. Uh, TotalView is available to run on your supercomputer and it's also available to run on your laptop. I see a lot of Macs here. You can download it onto your Mac and do, if you tend to do coding on your Mac, you can use TotalView to debug it. The good thing is that it no longer crashes Yosemite. We had a, a period where people were coming along and saying, you're installing it on, your, uh, on their new systems and saying, my system crashed. I was running TotalView and all of a sudden the system crashed. It's like, uh, we, we figured out what was going on around the, wrong there. We were setting the permissions incorrectly, but now, now it all works fine. We haven't heard of a, a uh, crash for years. That leads us to questions. Uh, using TotalView, if I uh, use like OpenMPI, yep. so is it possible to extract the values of like MCA parameters, uh, the monitor component architecture parameters? The, you're looking for the uh, the parameters for the for the underlying OpenMPI. Yes, uh, like when there's a uh, uh, when there's switching from Eager protocol to Rendezvous protocol, so it would occur at a particular message size. So those components are set within uh, OpenMPI. So is it possible to extract those values uh, using Total View? That's a good question. I'm not really sure. I, I know we're. We can have I mean, something like OpenMPI. You can, I mean, usually I build my own version of OpenMPI just downloading the source code. So all of that is available. Um, as getting those type of parameters, maybe. <laughs> but, but we, 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 don't, we don't delve into the hardware so much. So if, if that's the type of thing you're looking for now.